right, welcome to Conference 2 of the ECG Stampede. I'm Ben. And I'm John. Let's get right into it, John. You ready? I'm ready. Let's roll. Here we go. All right, this is a 57-year-old male that presented with chest pain. John, what do you see? Uh, I see an ECG in front of me. <laughs> so go on. The, uh, the rate here is about just about 100. The rhythm appears to be sinus. There's a P for every QRS, QRS after every P. The P waves look uh, similar in morphology, and the P wave axis is appropriate. The overall QRS uh, axis is normal. Looks like we have normal intervals. Uh, and when it comes to ischemia, I do start to see some signs of ischemia. I see some ST elevations in the inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF. I see some reciprocal depressions in the high lateral leads, 1 and AVL, and maybe even starting to creep into the right precordial leads in uh, V2 particularly. Yeah, so, and what do you think about the, the ST segments in 2, 3, and AVF? Because if you look at the degree of ST elevation, maybe 3 has 1 millimeter. The rest of them, I, don't, I think they're not quite 1 millimeter. They're sub-millimeter, so some may say this doesn't even quite meet the criteria for... It's STEMI because it's not at least one millimeter. But what do you think about the morphology of those segments? Sure, the segment looks pretty horizontal to me. Yeah. Um, so even though it might not meet our, uh, you know, AHA guidelines in terms of uh, criteria to, for STEMI, um, the morphology is really concerning to me. And with the associated re reciprocal depressions and the, you know, typical chest pain symptoms that this patient came in with, I am highly concerned in activating the, the cath lab, calling this an inferior STEMI. Definitely, yeah. Reciprocal changes really clinch the diagnosis, but that straightening, they call that straightening of the ST segment there, where you don't have the nice concave up sort of morphology. They look straight or horizontal, like you said. Um, yeah, that morphology is pretty worrisome. So what do, you, what do you think is the most likely culprit artery here? So I'd put my money on, on an RCA lesion here. Um, the reason being it has the inferior involvement. We start to see the high lateral depressions. And then given the, the associated depressions that we see in V1, V2, um, I, I would, I think this is highly consistent with an RCA occlusion. Yeah. And it probably involves the right ventricle. I don't have right sided leads. If you wanted to really confirm that you could just take the precordial leads and reverse them or just take like V3 through V6 and just reverse them on the other side of the chest and run another ECG and see if there's any elevation out in the precordial leads there on the right side. And if there is, then you would just call that th there is right ventricular involvement. So that would be an RV infarct. But there are some other features of this, like the fact that the ST segment in V1 is isoelectric um, if it were either isoelectric or elevated, that would suggest, you know, right-sided infarct. And then in V2, you see some ST depressions, and then V3 is back to being isoelectric. So when you see that sort of a pattern, that really suggests a right ventricular infarct. What sorts of things can go wrong in patients with right ventricular infarcts? So the big thing that we always get worried about is hypotension. Um, the other major complicating factor that we see in these folks is AV blockade, um, mm -hmm. and that's because of the RCA and the branch of the RCA and what that is supplying in the heart, uh, particularly the SA node. And, and the AV node, too. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so this patient has chest pain. I want to give him nitro, yes? Uh, probably not. I think that's probably a bad idea. In this 4K. Scenario. So these uh, RV infarcts are typically preload dependent. Any sort of preload reducer like nitro, um, even things like diuretics probably would be a bad idea in this because you're going to drop their preload and, and tank them and they're going to get real hypotensive real fast. Okay, so fluids. Fluids, good idea. Probably would be a bad idea to administer Viagra to this guy too. Yeah, it'd be unfortunate if that were the case, you know, hopefully, a little yeah, hopefully administration in the before. ED. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, keep that preload up. We're going to give fluids for hypotension. We're going to look out for AV blocks. Obviously, we're activating the cath lab as quickly as possible, trying to get this guy taken care of, right? Yep, sounds good to me. Okay, number next. So this ECG is from a 72-year-old woman who came in complaining of typical chest pain. Before we jump into the ECG, Ben, what does typical chest pain mean? I hear this term thrown out a lot. Um, typical chest pain to me means that it's typical for acute coronary syndrome. And so we're looking for features that really kind of validate that. 
And so I really think about four things. I may throw a fifth in there and that would be duration of symptoms. But when I think about chest pain, that really sounds consistent with acute coronary syndrome. There's definitely four things that really stand out that have kind of been borne out in the literature for increasing the likelihood of acute coronary syndrome. And that would be chest pain that radiates somewhere, either to the right or to the left. Actually, bilateral would be a little bit more specific, but any sort of radiation, you know, jaw, shoulder, those sorts of things get me a little bit more worried. If I see sweating, and I think if, if you see your patient sweat, that should make you sweat. So diaphoresis would be another one. Exertional symptoms, so symptoms that get worse with exertion. And I often ask them, like, hey, if you got up and walked over to the bathroom right now, would that make your pain any worse? And that's kind of how I elicit that. And then nausea with vomiting. Everyone kind of feels, it seems like everyone comes in uh, with some degree of nausea. But I really like to see the with vomiting. If I, if I see nausea, vomiting, and chest pain, that also makes me really worries, worried. So if they're starting to kind of, you know, check a two or three of those boxes, now I'm getting a little bit more worried. And also I would throw in duration too, because duration really shouldn't be seconds worth of pain. We're talking like at least 10 minutes worth of pain that is either episodic or continuous. Yeah, sounds good. So how about the CCG? What do you see? I see a heart rate that's at about 100. The rhythm looks sinus. I see a P for every QRS and a QRS for every P. The axis is normal. The intervals all look pretty normal to me. That PR is kind of borderline right around 200, but I call that normal. Everything looks pretty normal. And then in terms of signs of ischemia, I do see some signs of ischemia. I see multi-lead ST depressions, especially in inferior 2, 3, AVF, and lateral leads, V5, V6, uh, also in one right there. And so whenever I see multi-lead ST depressions like that, the next thing I want to do is I want to take a look at AVR and see if there's AVR elevation of at least one millimeter, and there is. So to me, in a patient with typical chest pain and this ECG, that screams triple vessel or multi-vessel disease uh, or left main invo involvement, something that is causing diffuse subendocardial ischemia of the heart. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And, but I think the key part of that is that while this pattern is associated with triple vessel disease or left main or proximal LED disease, that should only really be your thought process in folks with typical chest pain symptoms. If, if their symptoms don't equate with that, we should be thinking about other things. And there's a list of things that can cause this pattern on the ECG. Let's do it. You want to yeah. go through the list? Yeah, let's play the game? It. Let's do it. All right. I'm uh, well, I'm, I'm just going to do the obvious first one here. So in STEMI, you know, triple vessel, uh, left main disease, that sort of thing. Okay. All right. How about uh, let's go with PE. Ooh, very nice. I like that. How about an upper GI bleed causing severe anemia in someone who already has some degree of coronary artery disease? All right. How about maybe metabolic disturbance like hypokalemia? Oh, we talked so much about hyperkalemia, but yeah, you're right. Hypokalemia can cause ST depressions as well. Um, how about respiratory failure or like bad hypoxia? Okay. I'll add on, let's say, tachydysrhythmias. So things like SVT, when we see these heart rates in the you know high 100s, well above 150, this pattern is normal and it'll typically resolve when we have uh, some rate control. Okay, all right. I'm gonna throw another one in. How about sepsis? Severe sepsis with some end organ dysfunction. All right, I'll buy it. Um, maybe something that's a little less concerning than what we have on the list, something like left ventricular hypertrophy. Yeah, LVH will will do that, and and that's something to be aware of. If you've got a strain pattern on the ECG, you know, those asymmetric T waves out in the lateral leads, and you've got these big QRS complexes, uh, not uncommon to have inferior lateral ST depressions and AVR elevation in the setting of LVH as well. I, I think I'm tapped out. I think that means you won. I won the last one, so... I, we're, we're even now. Yeah, I need I need to win. You do. This, this you one need... this one helps. <laughs> um, so yeah, just just to sort of wrap that all back up, the 
ST elevation and AVR with diffuse depressions sort of everywhere else is a pattern that can be seen in acute coronary syndromes, but the list is much more exhaustive than that. There's many other things that can cause it. They're all pretty bad. They're, yeah, they're pretty much all bad. Maybe LVH is not so much acutely bad, but they're all pretty much bad, so you got to keep that antenna up. Yeah, yeah, think about it. Okay, here is case number six, 58-year-old male that presented with sudden onset palpitations for 12 hours. I remember this guy, John. He said it was about 2 a.m. He had a drink of cold water. He couldn't sleep or something. He got up, he had a drink of cold water, and he was like, all of a sudden, I developed these palpitations. So very clear onset. Yeah, no. You, you so want to sure. interpret this one? Yeah, sure. So this looks like the, the rate is tachycardic. It's probably... Hmm, 120s? What do you think? 130s? Sure. On average. The rhythm looks irregularly irregular, I would say. Looks like AFib to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the axis is normal. It's a narrow complex QRS with relatively normal intervals. And I don't see any acute signs of ischemia here. Um, yeah, I feel pretty good about that so far. I'd call this AFib with RVR. So what sort of management options do you have in this patient who has a very clear onset of his symptoms 12 hours ago? He's relatively asymptomatic. He just has palpitations, no shortness of breath, uh, no chest pain. He looks pretty well. Yeah, so I think given that we have a clear time of onset and it's only 12 hours ago, we have sort of a few more tools in our tool belt than we'll normally have with someone who comes in with this complaint. First and foremost, what I like to think of, it's the most fun for me, it's part of things that one of the things I really love about emergency medicine is electricity. Zzz, let's zap this guy. Shock him. So we can shock him and use uh, use electricity. We can use medications to chemically cardiovert him. Out how of this how much? How, if you did uh, shock him, how would you do that? Uh, so I would probably give him some medication to help sedate him a touch. Um, personally, uh, depending on comorbidities, but in this sort of relatively healthy guy, I think automate is probably a reasonable option. Um, it's relatively short acting. I usually don't use um, full sedation doses in, in these cases. I usually use something somewhere in the realm of about half of our typical sedation dose. So instead yeah. of using 0.3 mg per kg, I'll use somewhere in the 0.15 to 0.2 mg per kg. Okay. Um, and in terms of electricity choices, we're going to synchronize cardiovert this patient. Cardioversion. And in terms of dose, typically AFib, A flutter, you'll be able to cardiovert at relatively lower doses of electricity than things like ventricular tachycardia. So I'll usually start out in the 50 to 75 range before jumping to 100 if I need it. Okay, yeah, I put 50 to 100 in there. AFib can be a little bit challenging sometimes to shock some patients out of. Flutter is usually really easy to get patients out of. But yeah, you can start a little bit lower than you typically would for something like ventricular tachycardia where you're starting at least 100. You'll probably just jump into at least 200 in those patients. But um, yeah, you can start a little bit lower with this. Okay, good. So what are the other options? Uh, we can chemically cardiovert. And so we can give some medication. Like what? Uh, so typical antiarrhythmics that I think of is something like amiodarone. Amiodarone. is an option. Um, you may see like something like flecainide or ibutilide. I probably spelled that wrong. Yeah, looks good to me. Okay, all right. What else? Uh, we could just simply rate control this patient. And what would you use for that? Uh, you have a few different options, things like beta blockers, metoprolol, uh, or calcium channel blockers, diltiazem. Okay, good. Doses? Uh, I usually start with about 5 milligrams IV for my metoprolol. You can give that a couple times, up to about 3. Um, calcium channel blockers, again, weight dependent, typically end up somewhere around 20 milligrams IV push with your first dose. Somewhere in the 0.25 mg per kg range is usually yeah. a reasonable starting dose. Okay, sounds good. Uh, anything else? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing that we always need to be thinking about when we have a patient with AFib RVR is why? Yeah. Um, is this a primary issue or is this a compensatory or secondary issue that we're dealing with? And that usually guides my therapy. Okay. So this guy, like I said, relatively symptomatic, pretty healthy dude. Uh, didn't really have any other complaints and no really great etiology for this patient's atrial fibrillation. So this used to be called lone AFib. It's just, uh, and that just 
means there's there's no identifiable secondary cause. It's true I didn't do an echo and make sure that he didn't have some terrible mitral regurg or something, but my lung auscultation is perfect for for um, detecting murmurs of mitral regurg. I, yeah. I have 100% sensitivity and specificity. I don't know if you knew that. The residents actually tell me that, so I did know that. Okay, good, good. You're well known. And, and that, it's, so. it's usually, I mean, those numbers that I gave you are after I look at the echo report. <laughs> then I then I can really hear the hear the murmur just perfectly. Yeah, agree. Okay, okay. So guess what I chose in this guy? Uh, I knowing you, you absolutely shocked this guy. Woo <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Uh, he wanted to know what I would do, and I was like, well, I would just do the electricity. That's supposed to be lightning, right there. That, I get it. I okay. Get it. <laughs> so that's what we did. Shocked him out. He was a happy camper. He went home. Lovely case. Yeah. What would have uh, what would have pushed you away from using electricity in this case? Um, if I didn't have a very clear onset, I probably would I would favor rate control. But in someone who has a clear onset of symptoms within 48 hours, it's extraordinarily safe to cardiovert these patients. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I pitched the option to him. He wanted to pursue that. The thing that we really worry about is stroke so if your atria are fibrillating you know they're going like 600 fibrillating at 600 times a minute you get a lot of stasis and you're prone to developing clots because of that stasis in the atria especially the atrial appendage and the thought is that once you regain that coordinated activity you can kind of break off that clot and send it systemically and you can get a stroke uh, it turns out within 48 hours, that's really like less than 1% of cases, and that's even without a control, which I suspect a control would be the same. So this is really safe to do within 48 hours, and I think it's something we should be offering our patients. Yeah, absolutely. Did, um, did you send this patient home on anticoagulation, or was there a thought of that? Yeah, we thought about it, uh, and we used the CHADS VASC score. And this is not a scoring system I suggest you memorize. You can look it up on MD Calc. And suffice it to say that its guidelines would recommend anticoagulation with something like warfarin, Lovenox with a bridge to warfarin, or um, a Pixaban, or what's this, Zarelto, Rivaroxaban, something like that. Uh, if the Chad's VAS score is two or greater. And if I remember right, his was just one. Uh, so we decided to not do that. I gave him follow-up, and I said, hey, you can have that discussion with your cardiologist. Yeah, sounds reasonable. And he went home. Next case. 71-year-old male that presented with altered mental status. This should be a relatively quick one. It's really just a reminder about this entity. John, you want to take it? Sure. So the rate here is uh, about 90. Um, the rhythm is a little bit difficult to discern. It looks regular. Um, I'm not totally convinced I see P waves. If you look at lead two, there are some very, very small, you know, upwards inflected, uh, what look like P waves just after the T wave. Um, so for a rhythm perspective, I do actually think this is sinus, um, but with a first degree AV block. Uh, the axis looks like a severe left axis deviation, um, which I think is likely due to a left anterior fasicular block. Uh, our intervals, is, there's a wide QRS complex. Again, this looks to be secondary to a right bundle branch block. We see the RSR prime pattern in the uh, right anterior pre uh, precordial leads. Um, so, and, and no signs of ischemia that I see here. So overall, I think that this is a uh, sinus rhythm with a tri-fascicular block, that right bundle plus, plus the left anterior fascicle and um, the, uh, the first degree AV block. Cool, yeah, so tri-fascicular block, a bit of a misnomer. There are three fascicles that are likely involved. And how many fascicles do we have, John? Four. Well, three. <laughs> What's the fourth? The posterior fascicle. Well, that's the third. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are we going to do about that now? Are we going to edit this out? We're going to edit it out. <laughs> that was supposed to be a softball, John. I was looking at my phone. I got a text message. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, the three fascicles. So, if someone's got disease of all the fascicles, that sounds that's bad. What? Let's try this again. What could that progress to, John? Complete 
heart block. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> right, you are MS4, John Giordano. Excellent. What a struggle. <laughs> don't, don't record and check text messages from your parents, folks. Uh, okay, yeah, so this is just a reminder about what a trifascicular block is. And just know that if you see this, the patient has a lot of infranodal disease and is at risk for complete heart block. If they develop or if they present with something like syncope or even pre-syncope um, or even altered mental status, I'd be really concerned that this patient had intermittent complete heart block. Okay? Yeah, nice case. Cool. So this last one is a 60-year-old gentleman who came in after he reports having his uh, internal defibrillator shock him at home. Why don't you take this one? This is a really cool case. So this, this patient has a wide complex tachycardia. He is tachycardic to, I'd say about 130 to 140 or so. And the rhythm is probably ventricular tachycardia. We're gonna go over some of the reasons why I think of that here in just a minute, but let's kind of finish the rest of the interpretation. Um, so the axis here, there is, actually the axis is kind of a no man's land because there's a, a deep S in one and then AVF is also down going. So it's in that extreme right axis deviation quadrant that's kind of, I call it no man's land up there. Um, and then the intervals, there is a wide QRS. I don't see any P waves, so I can't comment on a PR interval. The QT looks uh, okay. And then in terms of signs of ischemia, well, I don't see any overt signs aside from what is probably ventricular tachycardia. But let's talk this really rhythm case. So let's talk about this rhythm. I think this is VTAC, and there are several features that suggest that. One is that if you look in V1, you have this RS R prime pattern. But notice that the first bunny ear is bigger than the second one. Is that typical for a right bundle branch block? No, that is backwards. Right, right. And so anytime that first bunny ear is larger, that should really make you think about ventricular ectopy. That's usually ventricular in origin when you see the first bunny ear that's larger. You're also in no man's land with the axis like we had mentioned before, and that makes ventricular tachycardia more likely. And the thing that really cinches it is you can see this patient has a pacemaker because I can see some pacemaker spikes here, right there and there, followed by a QRS. And both of those QRSs have the exact same morphology. This is a capture beat. So the pacemaker is getting through intermittently. For whatever reason, the defibrillator does not appear to be working properly. Otherwise, he would not be in ventricular tachycardia. But he has a couple capture beats there, and that suggests... AV dissociation. A cat, captured V is just when one of the beats makes it through to the normal conduction system and you see that beat propagated on the, the ECG. And that, that really suggests complete AV dissociation. Cool. So what are you doing with this patient? Uh, well, you know what my favorite thing is. <laughs> oh, another lightning bolt, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, this one. That's a lightning bolt of 200 joules right there. That's a big lightning bolt. Yeah, that's a big one. So if he's unstable, I'm just going to defibrillate him. If he's stable, we'll do some synchronized cardioversion. If you wanted to try some drugs, that would be fine. You could do that. I would go to procainamide. That's the one that has the has been has demonstrated the most efficacy. So that would be my go-to for for uh, chemical cardioversion of ventricular tachycardia. Yeah, love it. I, like I think we're done. I Are like the, we, I like I the shock better, though. Yeah. Are we done? I think we're done. All right. Adios. Adios. See you next time.